Hello, Danbury Concert Chorus. I wanted to share with you a presentation I made a number of years ago on Haydn's creation. There's a number of audio clips, some interesting information, and I thought it might be something you might enjoy watching. So this is a conversation about Haydn's creation and how it was kind of a bridge from Handel to the Romantic era. We've talked a little bit about this in rehearsal. So first thing is to identify the genre that Haydn's creation is. It's an oratorio. An oratorio is a musical genre written for soloists, orchestra, and chorus based on a biblical text or character. The oratorio was first created as a substitute for the opera in the early 17th century in the Catholic Church in Italy because opera was banned during Lent, the season uh, that precedes Easter, the season we're currently in in the Christian church. These early pieces were often performed in the oratorio, the prayer hall, uh, and were a great opportunity for folks to come together uh, and see a musical play related to some different biblical character they uh, knew. As oratorio uh, moves forward, there's a couple different ways. Uh, there's one, the oratorio volgare, which was in Italian, and the oratorio latino, which was in Latin. Most of the early ones were in Latin, but then as we started moving across the Baroque era, it started being in the language of the, the people. So that's why we have a handle in English and a Bach in German, things like that. It was a very popular uh, genre in the Baroque era uh, and definitely uh, became its own thing that was done throughout the year, not just during Lent uh, by the time we uh, get to the heart of the Baroque era. Uh, sometimes oratorios used Greek or Roman mythology as their storyline, but that really ended up being a lot more of, of opera also. Th this was really, when it first started, a Christian uh, genre, and really in many ways stayed that way as if we think about our favorite oratorios, they almost always fall in that category. So Handel uh, was probably one of the most famous uh, writers of oratorio, uh, and he moved uh, to Italy from Germany, and he did write a lot of operas in Italy, and he also heard the oratorio being done and, and saw the use of it, um, And but he only wrote a couple oratorios uh, during his time in Italy. By 1712, Handel was living in England and writing music for King George I. Uh, he began to have lots of accolades for his Italian operas in England, uh, and so there's a lot of his operas were being done in Italian, uh, even in England, but he also started writing operas in English. So Handel's first oratorio was Esther, uh, written in about 1718, the first English oratorio. But then he didn't write any more for quite a while as he was getting himself more established. But beginning in the 1730s, Handel's English oratorios became the fad of the English Baroque audiences. Handel's oratorios were performed during concert series, which he himself uh, created and developed. In fact, Handel was as much an entrepreneurial producer as he was a composer. Uh, one of the big festivals that was created was the Three Choir Festival. It became an extremely popular three-day event, uh, and it was actually an opportunity to raise money for charities, which was a completely new idea. And so Handel would put on these big gargantuan concerts for days on end as a way to fundraise for charities for the poor. Handel himself was also kind of poor, uh, and so he might have also been writing and uh, producing these so that he could make some money uh, so that his charity of his own wallet was built. 
Handel died in 1759. After his death, there were annual commemorations of Handel's music, mostly his oratorios at Westminster Abbey. And in fact, we know because of these events that uh, Handel's Messiah is one piece that's probably been uh, performed every single year uh, since uh, Handel's death, um, all the way back to 1759. Kind of amazing. These performances were uh, of an extremely grand scale. They often had over a thousand musicians performing and thousands of people in the audience. Uh, definitely not social distancing uh, for today, but maybe we could have a thousand musicians and a thousand audience members online. The, in fact, the Centennial Commemoration 1859 used over 3,000 performers. Pretty amazing. Here's a picture from about 1784 of a Handel Commemoration concert at Westminster Abbey. And you can see all of the choir members and orchestra and everything all over the place. Pretty amazing. Well, Haydn attended one of these big commemoration performances, and there he heard two pieces, Messiah and Israel in Egypt. It is noted that Haydn was particularly enthralled with Israel in Egypt, especially the depiction of the plagues. He was completely blown away by the performance of these oratorios in such a grand scale that when he heard the music of Handel in London, he was struck as if he had been put back to the beginning of his studies and had known nothing up until that moment. That's a pretty amazing thing to hear from a 59-year-old Haydn, someone to say, I had encountered something that I uh, had made me feel like I knew nothing. Uh, kind, of, kind of fun to imagine a 59-year-old Haydn feeling that way about a moment in time. Haydn wrote the creation from a libretto first intended for Handel. He received the libretto in 1795 and completed the work in 1798. The creation is written in three parts, as we talked about in rehearsal. We were just going to be planning on doing parts one and two, which were the days of creation. And then the third day was that of Adam and Eve. He, uh, Haydn, used the, the use of the chorus uh, just very similarly to the way Handel did uh, in both response to the soloists and in large fugue-like sections. Haydn's dream for the creation from the beginning was that it would be a large-scale international composition. The first publication included both German and English texts. No, it's known as the first bilingual text underlay of a major work that was published. With the intention that both the text in German and in English would become equally authoritative. So the English version that we are seeing is the authoritative version that Haydn was hoping for. The first English performance was held at London in one of these large commemorative concerts in 1800. There are three main factors uh, which make the Haydn creation remarkable. One uh, is the orchestra and the orchestration. A number of the instruments he heard from at the 1791 and 1795 Handel commemorations made their way into the creation orchestra. Clarinets, Haydn almost never wrote for the clarinet. The contrabassoon, virtually unknown in the Venetian audiences. This is a, a instrument that's like an octave lower than a regular bassoon, super big. And then this kind of combination of three trombones. If we think of the Mozart Requiem, uh, it was very common to have three trombones. Uh, and so Haydn was, when he wrote, he decided he needed to have uh, 
this also within his uh, music. Next is the role of the orchestra as a distinct character, not just as an accompaniment, but as a character telling part of the story. And then the well-known humor of Haydn. We know of the Surprise Symphony or the Sunrise Quartet, <coughs> excuse me, um, but he brought this kind of <clears throat> humor to what would maybe in some ways be this very serious Lenten discipline. Uh, and so kind of kind of interesting. So the opening movement of the creation is one of the most remarkable musical moments of the late classical era, maybe even talking about it in the early Romantic era. Representation, representation of chaos, which kind of reminds us of when we go to the grocery store. Uh, and then we have Raphael's re, uh, recit, uh, where he talks about the world uh, being dark and then the, li the light coming in the opening chorus and the depiction of the light. Haydn was extremely secretive about his setting of the word light and nervous that he had to wow the audience, you know, those thousand people audiences with a thousand people in the choir. Uh, it really electrified when they heard his version of that. All right, so I thought I would play a few musical examples. And if you want to grab your score, you can press pause, uh, grab your score. Um, but we are on page three of our score of Haydn creation. And let's listen to this opening recording. Here's the clarinet. felt when the word light hit with the orchestra, this just glowing, uh, goosebump-inducing experience. Uh, quite, quite a really neat beginning to a piece of music like this. 
So the use of the orchestra as a distinct character, not only as an accompaniment, as a representation of text, but as a storyteller, was something to share with the audience. Something that would be much more common when we get to the Romantic era, when we think of uh, Berlioz Symphony Fantastique or something like that. Haydn uses the orchestra to do a variety of things, to show the rising of the sun and the moon for the first time, uh, to paint a picture of the first storms on the earth, uh, to paint a picture of the first animals on the earth, and uh, especially the heavy beasts that trod upon the ground. All right, let's listen to Rising of the First Sun and Moon. I guess that wasn't the first sun and the first moon, but the, the sun and the moon. Uh, that was actually on page 40. So if you want to go back uh, to that, uh, you know, just rewind a little bit on the video and listen to that again on page 40 and 41, uh, you might find that nice. Uh, the next one is the storms, the different storms that happen. And I'm going to find for you the right page to look at that also. All right. Page 13.
<laughs> Quite a, a variety of different sounds that we heard uh, there uh, between uh, the, the droppings of the rain and the thunder clashes and all these different uh, parts, which I think Handel uh, does a great job showing us uh, what's happening there. All right, so the next one is the animals. Uh, and so let's listen to that. This is page 78, 79. Suddenly, a pastoral sound for us to have the cows. <laughs> yes, Michael, or the bass, then this, Michael is going to be the bass for our performance too. Uh, this, this recording is actually from when I uh, did creation at Concordia a number of years ago. And so the three soloists that are in the, the, what we're listening to now were three soloists that we were going to have for our, our performance. So 
Uh, Michael is great. The last little one I wanted you to listen to was the one that I think is maybe the funniest of the moments. The heavy beasts uh, upon the ground. This is on page 82, and this is where the, the uh, contra bassoon is used to create this large, uh, maybe farting sound uh, of the large and heavy beasts. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just like a moment in time, it, 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 it'll skip right by you if you're not paying attention to it. But uh, quite neat, quite fun. All right. So uh, one of the things we have here is Haydn was a master composer and orchestrator. He was considered the father of the classical symphony. We mentioned that he he was a uh, he had a very long life. He he actually spanned his life from. 18 years before Bach died in 1732 when he was born, uh, until 1809, a year after the premiere of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. So what we're talking about is Haydn was a, a composer who had uh, stood the test of time. Uh, he had written across the classical style and in, more or less invented the classical style. But even with this piece, he was almost, uh, in, kind of inventing or, or for, foreshadowing some of the romantic language. So here's a composer who really uh, is on his best game. Uh, he was also known to be a deeply religious person. And let's just listen to this. It's, this is The Lord is Great. Uh, and The Lord is Great is one of our um, choruses that we have. Let me just see if I can quickly find it for you. Page 69. Page 69. <laughs> Pretty cool. It's amazing to hear those fast uh, solo voices over the top, but there's just something very uh, heroic and amazing about uh, this 
music. So that's it. I hope that this little touch on some of the different pages, uh, moments in Haydn creation is something that you can enjoy while you're secluded at home. Uh, this recording was from Concordia College when we did that uh, a number of years ago. This is probably, oh, maybe almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and then there's just uh, some of the other things that you can see there as part of my bibliography. But I uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Hopefully everything sounded good uh, and this all worked. This is the first time I've ever tried to do a kind of video lecture using PowerPoint. So uh, thanks very much and uh, see you hopefully sometime in the near future.